Hey there! Welcome to church, as the little screen says there. We're glad that you're here hanging out with us today. My name is Nick, and we want to welcome you to the online uh, gathering of the Pathways Church community. We are a uh, little church that exists uh, in person in uh, Mill Creek, Washington, just outside of Seattle. But uh, I know there's many of you who tune in from all around the country, and so we want to say welcome, and we're glad that you're part of this community. Uh, even being uh, online here, maybe I don't get to see you face-to-face -face all the time. Well, you get to see my face quite a bit, but I don't always get to see yours, but uh, we're really glad that you are part of this community. Now, if it's your first time tuning in here and uh, interacting with this group, and you want to find out more about who we are, what kind of weirdos we are, uh, you can check out our website at findpathways.com. And you can read up on us a little bit there. Uh, we have some of our core values here listed in the corner uh, of the screen, but we actually uh, write a little bit more about those on our website. And I know you can't really get to know someone by uh, some words that they throw on a screen. It would be better just to get together and talk, right? Uh, but perhaps it'll give you just a little bit of an idea of kind of what group of people you have stumbled into here. Now, the words that we often use just very simply to describe ourselves if we're in person, uh, we'd say, well, we're kind of a cautious group and we're a little bit curious. Actually, we're probably a lot a bit curious. Uh, we are a cautious group in that many of us have grown up in religious environments or we've been around religion, primarily Christianity in the United States. And uh, while we have noticed that there's some really great things that religion has added uh, to our lives and experiences, we've also seen where religion has been used in harmful ways, destructive ways, exclusionary ways, leaving people out, harming people. And uh, many of us don't want anything to do with that type of religion. So we find ourselves being a little skeptical about organized religion because we've seen how easily it can be used to harm people. So we find ourselves in this weird space where we are a church but are a little skeptical about churches, me included, okay? Uh, but we're also a really curious bunch and that's part of what's made us uh, a little cautious about organized religion is that often we've had a lot of questions and it hasn't been okay to ask those questions. So we like to be a group that asks a lot of questions, that looks at things differently than perhaps uh, we thought of them growing up or we're taught to think about them. And so we like to challenge things, ask questions. So if any of those words uh, kind of fits you, cautious and curious, you might have found a good home here. Now, uh, it is the really the kind of the first part of September here. We want to say uh, congratulations and uh, we're praying for you for all of you students who are going back to school this year. I know for a lot of students, it was their first week back in school this week. And yay, can you believe it? Another school year has started. And I don't know, maybe you don't feel as excited about it as I just expressed there. But it is the beginning of a new school year. And for those of you who are students, we're praying that this is a really, really great uh, school year for you. It's been a very smoky and bizarre weekend for those of us in the Pacific Northwest. The big Bolt Creek fire up by Skycomish on Highway 2 has been burning. And uh, also in our thoughts and in our prayers here this weekend are not just kids going back to school, but many people affected by that wildfire that is threatening homes and uh, even the lives of people in that area. So we want to be thinking and praying for them uh, this weekend, especially as that fire is just really out of control, causing a lot of smoke and inconvenience in our area, but really close by here, um, causing life-threatening life situations for people around us. And so we want to be praying uh, for them. So if you want to join us in doing that today, uh, that would be great. Now, uh, what we're going to do here in this online space here is we're going to sing a couple songs. Uh, our worship leader, Billy, is going to lead us in a couple songs here. And uh, then after that, uh, there's going to be a little bumper video. And then I'm going to come back and we're going to talk about the Bible a little bit. And that's going to be fun. We're going to kind of get into the end of our uh, series here on the Bible. And uh, we have a couple few things to wrap up. And it's taken us a while to get to the end here because we've been interrupted by some summer things. Uh, but uh, we're going to kind of get into a little bit more today. We're going to talk about things that God accommodates uh, in the human experience, things that God may not prefer himself, but goes along with because uh, it is a human idea. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit and how it plays out in the Bible. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have a time of communion. And so if you want to join us in that, you're welcome to do that. In our in-person environments, what we do is we provide bread and the cup for you to take. They're elements that represent the body and the blood of Jesus. Uh, they aren't anything magical. It's just a sacred moment where we go and we remember that uh, Jesus was God in the flesh who came, died for us, came back to life and offers us 
a new quality of life that we can uh, enter into as well. And so if you want to join us in that in the online space here, uh, you'll just have to get a couple elements together. Maybe raid your uh, pantry for some bread or a cracker and uh, find some juice or maybe some leftover wine from the night before and you can get those elements together and at the end of our time here online you can participate in that with us if you would like to. Okay, I think that's enough for the intro stuff today. Uh, let's get into a little bit of singing here, wake ourselves up. All right, if it's morning when you're watching this, I don't know if you've had your first cup of coffee yet, but you might be a little bit uh, kind of needing a little wake up here. So let's sing a couple songs and become aware of the fact that God is here with us today. Okay, Billy, take it away.
Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love oh, My heart will sing your praise Praise again Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my God
Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my call. Ah, oh, so glad you asked. I thought you were never going to get there. <laughs> um, and why does God seem like such an <laughs> asshole? Well, I think you should read the Bible very, very carefully. Um, or else you will think that God is an asshole. <laughs> and that it's... Um, not something that should be undertaken lightly. Uh, it's not the equivalent of a legal constitutional document that is supposed to set out what is good for you, set in black and white. It was not dictated in one go as the Quran is supposed to have been dictated. Uh, it's a book that bears witness to huge cultural shifts uh, over a period of time with some elements of very ancient texts, but a form of editing that comes into, comes pretty close to the time of Christ, if we're talking about the Hebrew scriptures. And then a really quite dazzling collection of preacher's manuals that attempt to enable people to bear witness to something that happened in the midst of all that and gave them a key to reading everything that went before it. So before reading the book, it's well worthwhile realizing that the only reason we have the book is because a group of people who we call the apostles bore witness to something happening in their midst that really shook up their world. And that what they're passing on, on to us is the shake-up <laughs> with the texts that help make sense of the shake-up. But if we just take the texts and think they're something else, then we're going to be left with an <laughs> our own and blame it on God. <laughs> does that, does that, yeah, what does the shake-up reveal to you who God m might be? Uh, well, in a sense, we've tried to talk about it before, how uh, uh, I want mercy and not sacrifice. Uh, the collapse of all forms of religion as being somehow dependent on violence and sacrifice, on the Jewish movement towards that understanding and on its definitive demonstration. Then how do we read the Bible? Well, it takes us back to where I was saying you before. Uh, it's the extraordinary story of the huge progress towards understanding that God does not demand sacrifices, that sacrifices are our way of making ourselves good by pointing out someone who is to blame and who receives responsibility, and that our being enabled to stand free of all that was done by Jesus occupying the place of death and shame 
becoming, if you like, in our language, the sacrificial victim, meaning we murdered him, so as to show us that sacrifice is abolished forever. And with it, all the cult cultural institutions that depend on sacrifice start to shake at their... Uh... Cut. <laughs>
mind-bending. How does this exist? Except for the fact what's incredible about it is that God actually exists as a relationship within himself. And we've seen that God chooses consistently to work through humans to accomplish his purpose, that he does things relationally. And I made the case last time that the work of the Bible is actually also relational, that God consistently with his nature partners with humans to create the Bible text. And if we can begin to see the Bible as a relational work, as sort of a partnership work between God's voice and the human voice that goes a long way into helping us understand what it is that we're reading and how to apply it. Now, we also looked last time at how your theology really influences how you think about the Bible. And we talked about two predominant theological takes uh, that are pretty different. One, determinism, uh, that everything has been determined by God, that you have no free will or choice in anything, you're just going along with God's blueprint. And uh, free will theology, the idea that humans actually do have meaningful choices and uh, the ability to have their own volition, uh, to choose things of their own volition, and that these choices they make actually have real world consequences for other people and God himself. Now, from a determinist perspective, which by the way, I am not, okay, but from a determinist perspective, the Bible sort of must be a unilateral work of God, meaning uh, only God has input in it, right? <laughs> I mean, it kind of fits with the theology of determinism that uh, the nature of existence is unilateral. God planned it. He took no input from anyone else. He just planned it, and now you live along according to the plan, right? And so this sort of mirrors this image of the Bible here. From a determinist perspective, that's often who holds to this view, of the Bible being a unilateral work, meaning God was the only one who had input in it because that's sort of how nature works. God plans it, we just go along with it. But from a free will perspective, when God breathes scripture, he does it using another word that we looked at last time, dialectically, okay? Uh, using a combination, dialectical just means like, uh, kind of two things that are opposite sort of existing at once. And this idea here is that when God breathes scripture, he does it using a combination of the divine and the human voice together, allowing humans uh, freedom to insert their own perspectives, their own personality, their own styles into the text while simultaneously still breathing his divine life into whatever it is that they create so that it might be useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. Now, determinists uh, would prefer uh, to see the Bible as determined by God alone, and free will thinkers like to think of God as, uh, like to think of the Bible as a synergy, rather, between God's voice and the human voice. And as a free will thinker myself, I think the acknowledgement of the presence of human free will in the Bible text goes a long way to explain things that might otherwise seem inconsistent or imperfect in the text. And we've noticed in the series, particularly early on, that there are plenty of inconsistencies and things that we might call imperfections or some have dubbed problems in the text. Now, I've told you multiple times up to here that I don't view these as problems, but one of the reasons I don't think of them as problems but actually features of the text is because if God is partnering with humans to create this text, then it's exactly the way that God wants it to be. That this is how God chose to tell the story using the human voice. And so we'd expect to find some of these human inconsistencies within the text. And if God's okay with it, then perhaps we should be as well. Now, uh, that is where we left off last time. And so I wanted to add just another building piece onto this reconstruction, right? If we're rebuilding a house here, I wanted to add one more brick to it here uh, that might be helpful to us. That not only does God partner with humans to create scripture and then give them the freedom to insert their own humanity into it, but that he also accommodates their mistakes at time. And that leads us to our word of the day, accommodate. That's our word for the day. And this word means just to fit in with the wishes or needs of another person. And just like a parent uh, with a kid has to accommodate certain incorrect perspectives of their kids until they're mature enough to know better, so God at times accommodates the, mis the mistaken perspectives of his people. And I suggest that we see evidence of this in the Bible itself, that scripture is made up of several prominent accommodations where God uh, sees the mistaken perspective of his people, but meets them in their mistaken perspective 
and doesn't necessarily correct them right there, knows that's their frame of reference, so he meets them there in an incarnational, relational way and moves them forward with the starting place of this misconception. And maybe nothing is as good of a case study on accommodation as the topic of sacrifices. And that's what I want to point out here a little bit today. There's, a, there's some other really good uh, examples of accommodation in the text, but let's just for a moment look at sacrifices. Now, there are lots of sacrifices in the Old Testament. You say, oh man, I open up the Bible text and you can't really get through the very first part of the Bible, right? You get in there into Leviticus and Exodus and Numbers, and it's just sacrifices everywhere, right? Lots of laws on sacrificing animals, right? You're killing animals and you're offering them to God. Uh, there's lots of laws on how to do that. There's lots of laws on what to sacrifice. Uh, there's laws on when to sacrifice. I mean, it's a pretty major part of Israel's history in the Bible is animal sacrifices and it's so much a part of their existence i mean the whole temple structure seems you know kind of built around it i mean it's such a major part of the old testament and israel's history you would think that certainly this must be god's idea right that god himself wants sacrifices and so it might sound sort of inconsistent and problematic then when we read texts that say that god actually doesn't need or want sacrifices. Let's look at a couple here. Psalm 51 verse 16 said the psalmist here is writing about God saying, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, instead is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Okay, the psalmist here is saying, I know you don't like sacrifices, God. I know you don't take any pleasure in them, so I'm going to sacrifice something else instead. Uh, Micah 6 is another great um, example here. Micah 6, starting in verse 6, it says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? And on to verse 7, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. Now, the, the the author here is expecting that you would answer no to those questions. What do I come to God with? Sacrifices, animals, even humans? I mean, it, what, what is it that God wants from me? He's, he's expecting that the answer to this is no. And so then he replies in this in verse 8, Well, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The author here is saying, what is it that God wants? Does he want sacrifices? No. He wants you to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Uh, another example here, Hosea 6.6. 6. The author says about God, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And we see actually Jesus even quoting Matthew, or uh, Jesus quoting Hosea 6.6 6 in Matthew 9, verses 12 and 13, it says, on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call the righteous, not the righteous, but sinners. Even Jesus here is going to quote this phrase that God does not desire sacrifice. And in fact, in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews goes on to critique the sacrificial system, arguing here, and this should blow your mind, that these sacrifices we see in the Old Testament, the whole sacrificial system, in Hebrews, the author is going to argue that it never actually even worked and that it really didn't even have the power to take away sins. Hebrews 10 verse 4 says this, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Whoa! All those sacrifices you were doing, they didn't really do the trick. Uh, jump down to verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. You see this whole sacrificial system? It didn't even do what it was intended to do. Uh, verse 8, first he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Wow! Now that's interesting. Did you catch that? 
There's parts of Moses' law here. They were in the law. They were in the Bible text. They were perfect in, or, in accordance with the law. But God didn't like or desire them. And sacrifices are one of them. Now, some read these texts, right? There's, there's some more even that I didn't put on the screen here for you. Uh, they read these where God or the prophet of God is saying that God really doesn't need these animal sacrifices. He actually wants something else instead. And so many people have read this and said, well, that is sort of a problem here in the Bible. It's inconsistent. I mean, we have all these laws saying that God wants the sacrifices and here's how you do it and here's what you do and here's when you do it and all that. And then we get these other texts where it seems like religion is confused because now it sounds like God doesn't want sacrifices. And so which is it? Does God want sacrifices or does he not want sacrifices? And from that unilateral position where only God has input in the Bible text, that is a problem. But from a dialectical perspective, it's all about our word today, accommodation. Accommodation, our word for the day. Not only does God allow human free will in the creation of the text, but he also works with our limitations or our perspectives and faulty assumptions. And perhaps sacrifice here isn't something that God initially wants or really ever wanted, but perhaps he knows that pre-modern humans expect to do sacrifices. And if he is going to ever connect with them, and they have all of these sort of uh, misconceptions here, he is going to have to accommodate their beliefs. It's sort of like if your kid believes there's monsters under the bed, you can try to convince them there's no monsters under the bed. But if you're really going to connect with them, you might have to accommodate that belief for a little bit and meet them right there in the middle of it. Now, let me give you some reasons here why God might want to accommodate this. Okay, the first one is simply this. It's his attempt to meet humanity on its own terms. And that is the kind of God we have. A God who would condescend himself, who would step down from his lofty position where he knows it all, down into our muck and mire. Even if we've got some bad perspectives here, he's going to be the adult in the room and he is going to come to us. God in the Bible is in the process of revealing himself. And humans in a pre-modern society, what they do is they offer sacrifices to their gods. They're trying to appease the gods. You know, it rains sometimes. It doesn't rain at other times. They don't really know why. It must be because the gods are allowing rain sometimes and withholding it at other times. So they do everything they can to appease the gods. And so they even believe that sacrificing animals to these gods would feed the gods, give them food to eat, and they would make them pleased and happy that the smell of the food cooking on the fire would actually please them and they might send the rain. It's a superstitious way of seeing the world. But if you're God trying to meet pre-modern people who are superstitious, you may have to accommodate some of that superstition. We see it early on in Genesis 4. Cain and Abel, two brothers, they offer sacrifices to God. But what's interesting about the text, one sacrifice is accepted, the other is not. We're never really told exactly why. But the thing that's even more interesting is that God actually never asks either of them for a sacrifice. They just assume that they're supposed to do that because that's what you do for a God. This is what the gods of that day required. And some of those gods, like gods such as Molech and Chemosh, they even required human sacrifices. Jeremiah 32 Verse 32 says, The people of Israel and Judah have provoked me by all the evil they have done. They, their kings and officials, their priests and prophets, the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem. And then down to verse 34, They set up their vile images in the house that bears my name and defiled it. They built high places for Baal in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to sacrifice their sons and daughters to Molech, though I never commanded, nor did it enter my mind that they should do such a detestable thing so make and so make Judah sin. You see what's happening here, what's being described in Jeremiah here, is that there is a sacrificial uh, system that's in place here. And it's not just animals, it's actually human children. And this was a common practice during in the ancient Near East to appease the gods, that you would sacrifice animals, but if you were even more serious about it, you might sacrifice your own children. And this is why Abraham isn't shocked at all 
at God's command to kill Isaac because he believes, well, of course, that's how the gods work. Now, of course, God is going to sort of upend that whole command with Abraham. He's going to make a point, right, and not let him go through with it. But the point here for us is how can God meet a people steeped in that kind of superstition without accommodating some of it? And this, I would suggest, is a form of incarnation before incarnation in Jesus. God stepping into the human muck and the human misunderstanding, superstition, and accommodating some false premises so that he can meet us right where we are. It's like when my kids were little, right? I I wanted them to have this developed view of God, you know, um, and understand that, you know, there's some things, not everything is black and white, there's some nuance, there's some complexity, there's some mystery. Uh, But of course, when they were very little, they weren't quite ready to grasp that. And uh, now as they've gotten older, they can grasp some of that complexity and mystery. But when they're very little, you just kind of understand things in black or white. And so I sort of had to just start there. Did I agree with it all the time? No, but I was going to need to accommodate some of it. And so animal sacrifice appears to not even really be God's idea or his desire. It's simply an attempt to meet humans on their own terms. Now, here's another thing that God does in accommodating animal sacrifice. And that is that he repurposes a pagan act. Okay, Because animal sacrifice is done to please the gods as sort of a cultural assumption, what do you do when you got gods in your life and you're wanting them to do something? Well, you make a sacrifice to them to coerce them to do what you want. And Israel, it, sh- it appears, is already doing this. They're already sacrificing to false gods. Uh, we get this in Leviticus 17. It's really the first instructions about sacrifice. And in Leviticus 17, verse uh, 6, it starts, It says, the priest is to splash the blood against the altar of the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting and burn the fat as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. They must no longer offer any of their sacrifices to the goat idols to whom they prostitute themselves. This is to be a lasting ordinance for them and for the generations to come. Okay, so this is some of the first, really the first instructions given about sacrifice. But sort of notice here uh, why this has to happen. It's actually uh, not a new idea. It's a replacement idea. The, the people of Israel here, if you, if you look there on the screen, uh, they're already sacrificing. They're sacrificing to something called the goat idols. And I don't know exactly what that is. Um, uh, the goat, isn't that Michael Jordan? He's the goat, right? Or Sue Bird is the new goat of women's basketball. Greatest of all time. I, I don't think that's what they were sacrificing to. Uh, they're sacrificing to some goat idols here. And God notices that. And so this idea, uh, these instructions then on how they're to sacrifice are actually a replacement idea for something that they're already doing. This is accommodation by repurposing. And it's actually, when you think of it this way, sort of beautiful. That God accommodates something that people are already doing. Now, sometimes we think we got to get everything right before God accepts us, right? That we got to get everything cleaned up and right before we can interact with God. But what we see here, even in this world of animal sacrifices, is that God is always coming to us, meeting us right where we are. And he takes their acts and he repurposes it. It's like he reclaims it. You know, it's like um, an episode of Fixer Upper where they take an old house, you know, the, the worst house in the nicest block, I think they say usually, right? They take this old house and they fix it up. They repurpose it. They use what's there, but they enhance it. And that is what God is doing here with animal sacrifice. He's meeting people right where they are and repurposing what they're doing to point to him. Now, another nice thing that God is doing here with animal sacrifices in using them and accommodating them is he is providing a visual of sin consequences. Because how God uses these animal sacrifices is to demonstrate the consequences of sin. Now, In the false god worship of the day, sacrifices were done for a very specific reason, and that was to appease the god's anger or to coerce them to do something that we wanted them to do. It was all for the sake of the deity, for the god. But Yahweh doesn't work this way. He doesn't need sacrifices to be coerced to love us. He already does. He already wants what is best for us. Uh, It doesn't convince him to like us anymore. And so what Yahweh does is to repurpose sacrifice to not for the benefit of God himself, 
but to remind humans of the consequences of their sinful decisions that lead to death. It becomes sort of a, a visual learning experience here. You know, uh, people have different learning styles, you know, like, uh, well, I'm a visual learner. I need to see it. I can't just hear a lecture. I need to actually see it, right? And so this becomes, uh, this animal sacrifice becomes a visual learning experience. In fact, this is why covenants are sealed in the Old Testament by cutting an animal in half and then walking between it. Uh, Genesis 15, God's covenant with Abraham. There's animals that are sawed in half, cut in half, and God walks through the middle. And uh, he says, you know what? So let it be to me if I don't maintain my end of the bargain here. And the whole idea there is a reminder of consequences, right? Uh, you know, if, if, uh, if I don't come through for you here, let me be like these animals who have been cut in half. And so animal sacrifices becomes this sort of visual learning experience of these are the consequences of selfish, sinful attitudes. It always leads toward death. When we cheat others, when we uh, take from them, when we hold our power over them, when we're uh, stealing, things like that. that, when we don't live lives that are generous, when we do these things, it leads toward consequences of death. Now, these ancient Near East pre-modern people believe that animal sacrifices appeases God and makes them do what they want them to do. But God then repurposes this act as a reminder to people of the consequences of sin. And so in this way, sacrifices aren't for God. They're actually for humans, for people. And that's ultimately what this act of accommodating uh, animal sacrifice does is it really appeases the human conscience. You see, we often think of sacrifice was about appeasing an angry God, right? Sometimes we think of what happened with Jesus that way, right? God's so angry at uh, humanity for sinning that he has to take his anger out on something. And if he can just take it out on Jesus, then it will let us off the hook. But then that is sort of how pre-modern ancient Near East people thought of sacrifices, that uh, they could uh, punish this animal, kill this animal in order to appease a God. But Yahweh here changes it around to really appease a human problem, and that is guilt. You see, pre-modern people can't conceive of what forgiveness even means without sacrifice. And how can God make this known to them without starting with what they know? In Israel's history, there's this special day called the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and you can read about it in Leviticus 16, where the priest entered the Holy of Holies and offered uh, on an animal who was killed outside, not actually in the temple, he was killed outside, uh, and brought the blood in uh, on the fire. And this, there was a second lamb then that was taken alive outside. And the priest would put his hands on the head of this lamb and he would tie a red cord around it and would release it into the wilderness. And that lamb, that goat was called the scapegoat. And on the head of this lamb, metaphorically at least, were placed all of the sins of the people. And this lamb didn't die. It just took the sins of the people outside of the community. And it's said that when that red cord was eventually found, it was brought back to the temple and it was hung until the red bleached out in the sun and became white, which was a reminder that the stain of sin had been washed away. Wow, God is so good at these pictures, tangible, physical reminders. But what I want you to see there is there's no idea of punishment there. There's no intent that God must punish one thing in order to let another thing go. What is happening, even when we really look at the Old Testament sacrifice system, what is happening really isn't to appease God at all. It's actually for the appeasement of the human condition where we feel guilt. Animal sacrifice was really a mechanism for people to clear their consciences, not a mechanism for God to forgive. You see, forgiveness isn't about taking payment from someone or something else in order to let someone else go. That's not what forgiveness is. That's just collecting a debt from another source. Forgiveness is about letting the debt go completely. And God does not need sacrifices to forgive. He never has. And animal sacrifices are a great example then of a divine accommodation. God is accommodating these needs and views of people even if they aren't his own. He will work with it. You get it? Now, there's other ways that God accommodates things in the Bible text. Um, there's several other examples. Uh, kingship. Israel wants a king. 
God knows that's a bad idea, but he accommodates the perspective. And in fact, if you read the Old Testament, there are multiple texts in the Old Testament that give us instructions for the qualifications of kings and for how to install and choose a king. And so much so that you'd think this whole king idea was God's idea, but it isn't. It's just God accommodating a human idea. Or another example of this would be divorce. God hates it. I mean, he just comes out in the text and says, God hates divorce. But he recognizes that in a fallen world, there are times that it is going to happen. He sees it happening also in ways that are inequitable and harm women or those with less power. And so God gets on board, accommodates it, and formalizes it into a legal way to do so, providing some rules around it to help protect those who have the least power in the relationship. Now, some people say, well, the text has all these problems because of these inconsistencies. God doesn't want Israel to have a king, but then he ends up giving them instructions for how to have a king. But I would say that these are actually problems. They're just evidences of how God accommodates humans as much as possible. And it's not because God is inconsistent or the Bible's inconsistent, but it's exactly what we would expect to see if God is partnering with his people, flawed people, and he is choosing to meet them right where they are, just like a parent meeting a child with a limited understanding. See, God is flexible. Wow. Have you thought about that? If God accommodates our fallen and faulty perspectives, that means God is flexible. And so I'd like to leave us with a couple just short words here today. And the first thought is this. Maybe God is still flexible. I mean, if God was flexible in working with humans in the, pra- in the past, perhaps he still is. I mean, I'd say he is, right? The character of God, I would say, does not change. The character of God, you can count on it. His character never changes. In fact, I would say that God at times must change his approach and be flexible in order for his character not to change because that's how relationships work. You cannot be a good partner or friend in a relationship and not be flexible. Flexibility is part of what makes you a perfect companion in a relationship. And so it makes you wonder, what is God willing to be flexible about today? What are some things that maybe perhaps weren't God's perfect ideal or his first choice, but that he's willing to work with? Because maybe we should be just a little cautious about what we condemn without having all the information. The second thought here is just a reminder that the Bible is very complex. It's a partnership of God's breathing using his own voice and the human voice. And it includes his accommodation of human limitations. It's not perfect in the sense we often attribute it to it. But it shows God's steady work to move humans slowly towards his way of thinking and living. And so we have to be very careful about just pulling out a verse here or there to make a point. I know we're really popular as Christians for doing that, trying to make a point and using the Bible to kind of punctuate our point. But we have to be very careful in doing that because the Bible itself is very complex. It's not unilateral. It's dialectical. It includes the divine and the human voice. And yes, all of it is useful. Uh, and for the life of the church, it's all God breathed but we must be very careful in how we use it because we may be trying to justify something that God has only, ha- has only been accommodating. And then lastly, I'd just like to point out that, of course, Jesus' death is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Just as God never needed to punish animals to forgive us, God never needed to punish Jesus to forgive us. Jesus is God stepping into our sin taking it all upon himself and allowing the penalty 
inherent in sin itself to do its worst to him. Sin carries its own penalty. Paul said it, the wages of sin is death. Not that God has to impose a further penalty on it. Uh, this, the, the consequences of sin that we read in scripture over and over again are the rebound effects where we sin, we sow some sort of greed or sin into the world and it rebounds back on us. And so Jesus steps into the human condition, allows all of the sin that we've sown into the world to rebound on him. And he is killed not to appease God, an angry God. No, Jesus is God allowing sin to kill him and then pronouncing judgment on it by rising from the dead and defeating it. And so this idea of accommodation, it affects even our notion of what salvation is. Because perhaps even our notion of salvation needs some deconstruction and reconstruction. It certainly did for the people of Israel. We want to go to the communion today and we want to remember how much God cares for us and loves us that he would step into our mess and allow our mess to put him up on a cross. And we want to be so uh, just amazed and thankful that God was able to triumph over the mess that we created by loving us all the way to the end, by showing that love is truly greater than all of the selfishness we have sown into the world. Billy's going to play a song for us, and uh, if you're at home or wherever you are, if you want to take communion and join in with us, that would be great. And then uh, we'll come back here for some announcements. But let me pray for us. God, we want to thank you that uh, you have shown us a new way to live, a way of living in um, self-sacrifice and love, other-centered love. And God, uh, we know that we have often sown selfishness into uh, the world that all of us have at some point. And um, God, we thank you that you have triumphed over that, that you've stepped into our shoes, that you've taken all the rebound effect of that upon yourself. You've allowed it to put you up on a cross, kill you, but that you've triumphed over it by coming back to life. And you've offered us a new way to live. We pray that you would help us to live into that new way of life always. Thank you for being a God who accommodates us, who meets us as humans right where we are, doesn't wait for us to get everything figured out, um, but that you step right into the middle of our mistakes and, imper and imperfections. You meet us right where we are and lovingly, like any good parent, uh, nurtures us along. We love you and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's go to communion.
Oh, thanks, Billy. That's great. That is such a great reminder that uh, there really is no place God won't go uh, to meet us. He'll take do whatever it takes to come to us. And that's really what we've been talking about uh, here today. Okay, let me give you a couple announcements here as we wrap up. First of all, uh, if you want to give, you can donate uh, to the Pathways Church community. Um, and man, we really appreciate those of you who have been uh, giving and donating, uh, particularly online. Uh, if you are participating here online, a uh, great way to help out is to uh, donate online. And you can do that by going to our website at findpathways.com slash donate. And uh, you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift on there, and uh, we would certainly appreciate that. Uh, this fall, we're also starting up some groups, uh, and uh, for people who are, live locally, we'll have some groups, but even if there are some of you who live uh, out in the hinterlands around, uh, we would love to connect up some of you so that you can meet together with some other people who live in your area. So if you're interested in being a part of a group, um, there are probably groups that will meet maybe once a month. Some of them will meet twice a month. Uh, they might even just meet for dinner to hang out and um, just build relationships. And so if you're interested in doing that, uh, pre please text us at 425-379-7284. You can just text the word groups uh, and your name and uh, we'll make sure to get back to you and help you find a group. Also, one of the groups that will be going on uh, is our Theology Pub. That's coming up this next week. Uh, we will be at Elliott Bay Pizza on Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. And then uh, we will be at Five Rights Brewing on the following week on Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Two separate weeks, one uh, in the south, one in the north, one on a Wednesday, one on a Thursday. Uh, and so if any of the, either of those dates works out for you, we'll be talking about basically the same stuff, but uh, you're welcome to come to one or both of them. And uh, this group meets once a month. We discuss various uh, 
topics. We have some drinks and food together and just sort of hang out. So if you want to join us at either of those, that would be great. Also, if you want to stay up to date with just uh, some of the news and updates that are happening, you can join our email newsletter. You can message us on Facebook and give us your name and email address, or you can email me, take a screenshot of the screen here. Uh, my email address is on there and I'd be happy to add you to our um, announcement email newsletter as well. Okay, that's pretty much it. We got one more sermon in our Bible series and then we're going to be moving on uh, and we'll get back to that next week. Uh, if you are around in October, we're going to have our uh, celebration anniversary party uh, the, like the third week of October and so that will be fun too. Okay, uh, hopefully the smoke dissipates and we have a good week. Uh, those of you who are going to be completing your, uh, entering and completing your first full week of school this next week, we're praying for you. We hope that goes really well. Uh, okay, we'll see you next time. Bye.